All right, Alex. So I'm, <laughs> I'm putting together your own special edition of the uh, of this slideshow. This is not my slideshow. I haven't had time really to put together, <coughs> excuse me, uh, any slideshows um, for the last GIS course, nor for this one, because both times um, that I've taught this course, it's been sprung on me <laughs> kind of at the last minute. So um, you'll have to apologize. I wish I had my own set of slides on this other information I'd like to convey, um, but uh, I just can't, I, I just don't have time to do it. So we'll just follow a pre-existing slideshow. This is one that uh, I believe Brian Schneider put together a few years ago. So um, I don't think you're going to learn anything new with this. So just kind of sit back and relax. And, and if anything new does pop out, uh, then um, uh, good for me, right? But I, I kind of doubt that that's going to be the case. So. Um, but I did want to go through this, so I, we do have a, a formal lecture that's going along with this class. So anyway, I'm just going to do a little introduction to GIS systems. And, uh, you know, again, you've had the full-blown GIS class, plus I've seen the work that you've done. Uh, you fully understand what a GIS is capable of doing. Um, one of the things that I've, that's always uh, kind of been fun for me over the years uh, is, finding out how much I don't know about GIS. Uh, there's always something new that you can learn with it. It's an absolutely amazing system that's continuously um, improving and morphing and being able to do, um, a, you know, almost at an exponential rate, uh, more and more capabilities. It's just, it's phenomenal uh, working with it. And one of these days we're going to come back and, and look at these old uh, antiquated computer-based systems and probably everything's going to be, you know, virtual reality and everything. So uh, we're all moving in that direction. We're, all, we're there already. Um, it's just uh, waiting, waiting for the rest of the world to catch up uh, to the technology. So uh, there's some amazing things going on out there. But in general, uh, a geographic information system is uh, basically it's a computer system that's able to do these five things. Okay, so it can assemble um, and uh, store data, uh, be able to manipulate data, uh, and probably the two most powerful things that it's able to do is to uh, analyze the data and uh, so that we can, we can draw conclusions uh, from uh, two or more different data sets. We can allow them to, to help us to analyze what's going on and answer questions about uh, some of the things that may or may not be going on out there in the real world. And then being able to display that information uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, it's been proven through time, through history, that maps are um, very, very good tools for um, spreading propaganda. <laughs> so, uh, the you know the map only says what you want it to say. So, uh, and that's kind of a, a lesson that we that we draw from uh, the art of uh, displaying data uh, using the proper colors. Uh, to display certain things um, and to convey a story, really, to uh, uh, we're using a map to tell a story. Uh, that you know, if we wanted to map everything in in the world out there, the map would be way too busy. <coughs> so we we create the map in such a way that it's displaying that information that we want to get across to people. So very powerful tool for doing that, <coughs> and it's always working with geographically referenced data. Okay, so um, it's, it always knows where it is in the world. That way, when you add more data to it, um, all that data knows where it's, it's supposed to go. Um, but the, uh, and there's lots of mapping software that's out there. Um, but the thing that makes GIS really important is um, it, Google Earth is a really good example of a, a very, very excellent spatial data tool. What it doesn't have is the tabular data. And the tabular data is the, as you know, it's the information about the spatial data. That is probably the most powerful part of the GIS, is being able to um, not only show things, but to ask questions about those things and be able to answer those questions. So for a road, the question might be, uh, what is the surface material of the road? And the answers to that might be uh, maybe gravel, maybe dirt, maybe uh, asphalt, maybe concrete. All right, so um, being able to answer those questions uh, about about various road types and uh, and same with just about anything you know a forest a forested area or a timber stand you know what's the age of that stand what's the species 
And that allows us to build this database information on our spatial data, and uh, which allows us to ask questions uh, ultimately about our, our spatial data. So I can go, all right, Mr. GIS, uh, for Haywood County, show me all the roads that are um, gravel, or show me all the, the uh, locations where roads need repair in Haywood County. And then I can, uh, you know, the GIS will be able to query through the database table, find all those, those e features that are for either road repair or all the line features where roads uh, surface type equals uh, uh, gravel and it will it will select all those roads and display them for me. So very, very powerful tool for being able to answer uh, spatial queries and those sorts of things. So, okay, now I'm just scratching the surface, obviously. I'm, I'm sure you've messed with this uh, uh, for, you know, quite some time now, so you're probably well aware of some of the feet, uh, ways that we can go about querying data. So, um, and of course, I know you're familiar with this as well. So how do we portray data? Well, a vector-based GIS, uh, as opposed to raster, which you, you realize is, you know, aerial photography or surface maps or those sorts of things, um, uh, is different. It's kind of a raster-based where it's a big grid and they, each cell in the grid is assigned a value. Uh, a vector-based system is, is different and the vector-based system uses uh, breaks maps up into either point features, line features, or polygon features, okay? And um, then it annotates those features as well. So you can, you can include uh, annotation in your map. What's really kind of funny is this picture right here is actually a raster grid. All it is is a topo map that's been scanned in. This is not actually true vector data that we're using to describe vector data in this slide. So go figure, right? All right, so um, let's move on down. Uh, why, why do we use GISs? Uh, I don't actually, you know, when I'm teaching GIS to foresters, I, you know, I go, why, why do you need to spend $1,000 or more uh, for a GIS that's all you're going to use is about 1% of its power? Why not just make maps on Google Earth or find some other mapping tools uh, out there because they don't, most foresters don't need the power of a GIS. And there's lots and lots of very good uh, mapping software that's out there nowadays. So um, that, that is a, a question I like to ask folks. I've taught tons of professionals GIS and we usually, <laughs> especially the older guys, usually within about 10 or 15 minutes, the eyes are glazing over and they're like going, oh my God, I got three more days of this. <laughs> so. Um, and they don't get as much out of it. But if you show them something simple like Google Earth, um, then, you know, they're all over it. They love it. So why do we use a GIS? Well, you use it because you're, you're trying to uh, really maintain a, 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 a kind of a professional inventory of the work you're doing. Uh, I, I use GIS simply because I know it so well, it's not an issue for me to try to learn it. So anytime I do a forest management plan for land, and I always do it in ArcGIS. Um, it just works that way uh, very well. And that data is stored in a format that I know how to use it. So I'm able to, uh, uh, down the road, after I've created this data set, I'm able to process and represent uh, large quantities of spatial data. Uh, you working within the Forest Service, you're working with large tracts of land. And uh, so you have the, uh, uh, definitely have a need for being able to maintain stuff in a very uh, or well-organized uh, database system. And uh, that, you know, you can go back and you can update it, uh, you can maintain it, you can go back and query it, and you're actually using it for what its intended purpose is. A consulting forester, for the most part, doesn't use any of that extra power of it. Uh, so it's almost, it's almost a waste of money to these guys. Um, and then uh, being able to convert uh, field observations into digital maps, okay? So, um, you know, I, I'm just kind of, I'm relating to some of our natural resource uh, type uh, uses for it. But, uh, you know, of course, GIS is, is used in just about just about all applied sciences. There's an example coming up here of one of the very first um, spatial analysis uh, uh, examples 
uh, in history, and it was done back in the 1800s, and it was uh, it was for medical purposes. It had nothing to do with natural resources or anything. So, um, all kinds of folks have, are using this uh, technology. Uh, so, you know, transportation systems, uh, even busing systems in in some of the um, uh, uh, larger counties where they have uh, highly populated counties, um, they, they use GIS to determine what the busing routes are going to be for school systems. Um, it's just used all across the board for, for just about everything. So um, anyway, let's take a quick look at, uh, you know, what we talk about with uh, GIS overlays. Uh, it's very important to know that in a GIS, you can only stuff one, uh, one, um, vector type of information in one layer of data. So I can't mix points, lines, and areas in, in one, uh, one layer there. So I have a layer there called stand type. It's a polygon layer type. I have information about each one of these stands in the polygon. Um, but for the same area, I have a hyd hydrology um, layer. And that hydrology uh, includes, uh, you know, uh, line vector data uh, showing where the streams are. Typically, there's some sort of a connector point and the water knows that it needs to flow this way. That's when you're getting into some of the more sophisticated uh, topological features that a GIS has. Uh, road systems for the same area. Okay, again, another uh, line feature. Um, on some of the more sophisticated transportation systems, they know which roads are one way, which roads are two way. Uh, which are on ramps, off ramps, and stuff like that. So that's why we can do things like um, tell my uh, Google uh, Google Maps that I'm trying to get from here to uh, Raleigh, and it plans out the proper route for me <laughs> rather than sending me down a one-way one road going the wrong way. And that's all this topological information that's in that's associated with each one of those road segments. Um, topography. Okay, the, again, these are this could be any number of, of uh, ways of, of uh, uh, depicting elevation. Uh, this just happens to be a series of lines, uh, line vectors uh, that are you know really have no other purpose in life except to show you know what the elevational range, uh, what um, <clears throat> what the contour is of the elevations, um, and uh, you can't really use this for slope calculations or aspect calculations. You could just look at it and glean information off of just that you know that's a ridge and this is uh, whoops sorry this is a drainage that's a drainage and it's a little ridge in between so and again but the beauty of the gis is i can turn on or off any one of these layers to get the information i need uh to be able to interpret that map and uh so here's that early example of gis you've probably heard about this one before but dr john snow in london uh, he was having some, uh, they are having some real problems with a cholera epidemic and lots of deaths. And um, I don't know, somehow he got it in his crawl there that uh, they might somehow be associated with the well water. Nobody really um, identified cholera uh, and, the, you know, this, this death that was occurring as something that could be associated with germs because nobody really knew anything about germs back in those days. So... Um, what he did, though, was, and I, I don't know the complete story behind it, but basically each one of these little black dots, he started to mark them down where people were dying, okay? And, uh, and maybe not just dying, maybe not simply dying, but people who were getting sick. Um, and then he also, I guess, maybe it was kind of an afterthought, um, but he noticed that there were certain wells that, clumps of uh, uh, cholera, epi cholera folks seem to be um, associated with. So these guys are drawing up, you know, nobody seems to be getting sick over by this well, the little X mark, but a whole bunch of people seem to be getting sick over at this well. So he started, uh, he, you know, to him, he, he was able to draw a um, spatial relationship between the, um, the well sites and where people were getting sick. Basically, uh, he told folks, let's, let's close up this well uh, and closed up, you know, a couple others that were associated in some of those large clumps 
And lo and behold, the cholera epidemic went, disappeared. And so um, he was a, a, a true hero. Um, and he was one of the first people who was actually taking spatial data and drawing some sort of a, a conclusion about what's going on in the world. Pretty fascinating guy. So since then, <laughs> everybody else in the world has been using uh, GIS or, you know, had decided to be able to use uh, uh, maps as ways of uh, identifying uh, various associations about the world around us. And uh, again, you know, to nowadays, we're using it uh, in numerous di different forms. Probably the most common ones that we tend to see uh, are in the county governments. Uh, where we're looking at the parcel maps and uh, you know that's something that's very important to us as natural resource managers is uh, uh, being able to um, uh, you know uh, identify a parcel of land who are some of the other uh, people around that parcel and um, you know uh, and be able to utilize that information in um, uh, as part of our management planning especially if we're working at the private sector and we're doing management plans for landowners. That's the first thing you need is, is the parcel. Um, so, you know, all of our counties, thank goodness, now have um, uh, a GIS. And, and I think every one of them has an online um, interactive GIS where you can query on a uh, property. Some of them are much more sophisticated than others. Uh, you look at, you go to Mecklenburg County, uh, go to Wake County, and look at some of the, the systems they have, and they just you know, blow you out of the water. Um, Buncombe County's pretty sophisticated. Haley County's pretty good. You know, the vast majority of them tend to give us the amount of information that's necessary in order to um, uh, glean information about parcel data, some uh, sometimes soils, uh, topography, stream systems, zoning, uh, is some of the more important things that we may need to know when we're um, doing exploration around some of these properties. Um, so they, they tend to give us uh, that information. Uh, a couple of them are really cool. Uh, check out someday if you get a chance, Transylvania County's um, uh, GIS. And when you select, uh, I, I don't have it pulled up right here, and to save time, I'm not gonna do it right now, but um, you can go out there, just Google uh, Transylvania County and you can, um, when you select a layer or select a parcel, it'll actually open up a little window on the side there and it will allow you to download that parcel in, um, uh, in Shapefile or, KLM, or K KML, Google Earth format. And uh, I usually just choose Google Earth. So um, I, I could pull up a parcel, uh, it'll download it in, in Google Earth, and I can, and it loads it right up into Google Earth with all the all the parcel information as well. So if I'm doing a landowner plan uh, in a, in a, uh, you know, Transylvania County, there's about five or six other counties that have bought into that particular system. Um, you know, all the folks who are, every time I talk to somebody uh, in in a county government and say, look, you know, you really need to start doing this. Uh, Hopefully someday down the road, everybody will be doing that. So to me, that's just, that's just, you know, what we really need is to be able to, uh, I'd, rather than me having to download the whole county of parcel data, I'd much rather just count, download the a parcel one at a time that, as I need them, you know, so uh, kind of cool. Um, so county governments are, are very important and uh, um, they've got, they're getting better and better all the time, so. Uh, another one that you've used, I know that you have because I've witnessed it, <laughs> is the Web Soil Survey. And you probably are well aware of the fact that you can now um, import a shapefile uh, into um, uh, Web Soil Survey as an area of interest. So you don't have to go in there and click on the little AOI button over here and then digitize, <coughs> heads up, digitize your uh, parcel. Uh, or what you think is your parcel, you can actually get your parcel uh, off of a shape file and then load it right on in there. So that's kind of nice. Um, the uh, here, I, you know, I think Brian was just really introducing folks for the first time to it. So I think he's just he's just went to Go uh, Buncombe County and kind of zeroed in on that. Found a parcel. Believe he probably heads up digitized it in there. And you know the rest of the story, right? So, um, uh, 
but the the point is it's just another very good use of a uh, of a GIS and what of course what they're doing is they're clipping the soils out from their GIS and then just uh, making it available to you and that's really handy because you can calculate the acres of the uh, of each soil type uh, that's inside your parcel um, and then it allows you to do you know um, a lot more glean a lot more information um, create the uh, the soil uh, survey you know custom custom soil survey for for a property uh, download it uh, put the landowner's name on it and look like a look like a hero to the landowner because they think boy oh boy this person really develops a very professional looking soil survey document and we just chuckle to ourselves and say <laughs> I didn't have to do all this they did it for me so that's kind of nice so anyway um, moving on uh, GIS is a uh, tool for public management here we are kind of getting into your realm and uh, of course when you're working with large tracts of land um, that it is important that you have something like a full-blown GIS otherwise it just gets too un unwieldy and um, so it allows you to over time you know start working with a data set like this buckhorn compartment and um, you may have started out with getting some sort of uh, a potential habitat and that's just using the uh, uh, basically the, uh, um, the bio uh, what do they call it the pre-european uh, settlement this is what it would look like if, if everybody just left it alone um, and uh, so that was one way of, of creating a uh, of identifying what you know what a uh, habitat uh, could look like right given uh, enough time to uh, uh, to maintain itself but then you can also compare that with what the actual habitat happens to be um, I always try to encourage people when they are creating uh, different uh, maps of different vegetation type um, my my uh, rule of thumb for folks is uh, uh, digitize what you can and and GPS the rest okay so whatever you can see from aerial photography and you can heads up digitize into a map that's the that's time well spent it's uh, uh, much much uh, easier to get information in that you can clearly see um, off of an aerial photograph so what are some of the ones that are really easy to see a maintained opening pretty easy um, a low elevation granitic dome you can bet your uh, bet your uh, bottom dollar that you're going to be able to see just a bunch of heath and stuff growing in there okay um, a white pine stand would stand out very, very easily. What won't? Uh, well, the, you know, you start getting into these montane oak hickories, montane alluvial forests. You really don't know where those boundaries are. Um, and uh, oak pine, uh, a pine oak heath could actually bleed into one of these low elevation granitics. It's kind of, kind of hard to tell the difference sometimes with those. All right, so you know, a lot of times. Uh, our hardwood forests or, or our uh, non non evergreen forests uh, are probably a little more difficult to tease apart, um, but some you can, and uh, so that requires you going out into the field and doing some inventory work. And then while you're in the field, you could modify an existing map and redraw some boundaries, come back and digitize that in. So, um, uh, soil types. Uh, you know, we don't really know where those boundaries are. We we have professionals best guess that for us, and uh, yeah, sometimes I'd say surprisingly, to me surprisingly, most of the time they're very very accurate about where those boundaries are. Sometimes they're off, but uh, I've always been extremely impressed with um, uh, the soils information that I've been getting from from the folks who've done them in this this part of the country, um, and it's because they've learned to read the land. Uh, the basically the uh, the land forms and the the ge geologic material that's there and the, the slope and aspect and you know elevation all those things they have learned to read those and say oh yeah uh, you know b based on the higher elevation on a on a you know south facing southwest facing ridge I would expect 
uh, not entirely sure, but I would expect there's a high probability that an ash chestnut complex is going to be found there. Okay, and then they set some uh, some plots and they they check that. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, but you know our soil maps are are invaluable uh, uh, tools for us. So that's really kind of neat. So um, then you can start adding some more <coughs> information uh, to this map too. Okay, so you're building and building all this uh, uh, a myriad of, of information that can be used and uh, you know, this one is just simply you know what is what's the fire regime been uh, in those particular areas uh, the drier ridges you might expect it to be um, more often and the moister areas you might expect it to be less often and uh, so that's uh, in you know in some way you might be um, coming up with probabilities for um, for fire in those particular areas. Uh, then you start looking at things like ecological departure, uh, which uh, you can glean that from. Uh, it may be, and I'm not saying that, that it is, but going back to these two, uh, the potential habitat versus the actual habitat could lead to an ecological departure sort of map. This is what it should be. If left alone, this is what it is. Um, and so there are folks who go out there and they do um, these types of departure indices uh, where they are basically saying, you know, I, I think this should be a southern and central Appal uh, Appalachian Cove, but it's, uh, you know, but it's not, and, you know, they, and they come up with this departure index um, for how, how far away is it from its um, probably natural state. And then management sustainability um, might be things such as, you know, uh, what, and again, I, I don't know what his bottom line was with this, um, what he was trying to prove with this particular map, but um, it's looking like, you know, harvest fire, oak shelter wood uh, is the type of um, management, uh, oh, suitability, I'm sorry, I was reading sustainability. So basically he's saying that all the green areas are suitable for doing the harvest and uh, having a fire regime in there uh, and then ultimately trying to convert that into uh, into oak through oak shelter wood and then uh, these other areas these might be more some of the more open areas uh, where they maintain by fire okay so you know so this is a planning tool this is uh they based on a lot of this other information uh, that they've thrown into these maps um, they come up with these um, basic suitability indices that they think might be, uh, uh, you know, where they might want to go uh, with a particular uh, part of land uh, that they're working on. So uh, all kinds of neat stuff out there that these ecological and uh, uh, ecosystem uh, managers are, are, are using in, in those ways. And they can, they can do that on our public lands because they've got, you know, a big chunk of land to work with and it's really kind of neat. So, um, you know, at the private level, uh, this is, you know, the, the bread and butter for most, uh, uh, you know, for the, both the state uh, and for private landowners, I mean, private foresters who are, who are working on management plans for landowners. So typically they're much smaller parcels, smaller tracts of land. I think the largest one I'd ever done was about 450 acres. Um, and uh, so, you know, it requires... Uh, uh, either just a minimal amount of work or, or considerable amount of work uh, to go out there and collect the data. But uh, again, the management units are kind of broken into um, based on what the current vegetation is or uh, what the landowner envisions that they might want to do with that particular area. So this vegetation may be very similar to that, but this landowner has decided that you know they want to do something different with this. Um, so you get you know two A and two B, um, and uh, they may have different uh, management objectives for those particular things. So, um, uh, current use, you know, that's uh, just how they're using the particular uh, land there. So, in the natural resource consulting, okay. So, you know, uh, I think one of the things that you had learned when you were working on uh, forest management. Uh, your management plan uh, is it's always good to have a good locator map uh, this is kind of serving that purpose 
uh, you probably would want to zoom out a little bit further. Um, they're just kind of showing in context of this person's property uh, and their, their resources uh, that this is the, uh, the track that they're going to be working on. And then within that, you know, somewhere I guess in here, there's that track right there. Uh, they're using some uh, raster data to come up with some sort of a slope uh, uh, map. Okay, and this is just basically from a uh, digital elevation model. And, and uh, I'm sure you did that in the GIS 101. I'm, I, I haven't seen that class in a long, long time, but I know that's something that we used to do and it would take uh, a DEM and it would look at one raster cell's elevation, compare it to the uh, raster cell next to it, and it would calculate the slope between those two raster cells and come up with a slope map for you. And uh, so that allows you to see the steeper slopes versus the non non steep areas and then everything in between. So again, you know, you get this ridge that's running through here, it looks like. Um, could be a drainage right here. I'm starting to look more like a drainage to me, actually. So um, and then you get the side slope. Um, so anyway, the uh, uh, you'd see it's steeper here, though. All right? And then uh, as you're going down the side slope and and into this this little drainage area right here, then it's probably becoming less and less steep. Let's see. Ah, yeah, now I can see what's going on. <laughs> and of course, throwing it on top of aerial photography uh, is very important. So getting the newest um, aerial photography is, is always uh, the best thing that you can do. There are some uh, really good sources out there for streaming uh, aerial photography in ArcGIS. And um, hopefully when you do that lab, that will be something new for you because uh, I walk you through where you can load those up. So we are going to be using ArcGIS, obviously, and you're extremely familiar with all these uh, parts of it. You've got Arc Catalog, and then you've uh, where you can manipulate um, maps, uh, uh, manipulate data, copy data. Um, you could also do a number of things in terms of the uh, the projections of data. So this is that's where I go when I'm uh, modifying the projection of a of a of a data set so that it will work with other data sets. Um, ArcMap is where you do you know most of your spatial analysis, and then you've got this whole series of tools out there that are just unbelievable that allow you to do um, uh, many many things that um, are not at your fingertips here they are there in the, in the toolbox so um, i'm sure you've probably explored some of those in the past as well so okay i'm not going to dwell on these i think you're you're probably yawning by now uh looking at all this uh, this is just old hat for you okay so um what we're going to be doing uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, first assignment is uh, very simple. Uh, I've got a, a series of, of uh, videos that you could watch um, <coughs> and follow along with, hopefully, uh, when you get ArcGIS on your computer. And uh, it'll be, uh, you'll be working primarily with shape files. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, <coughs> It's, I think the uh, hay fever has gotten down into my lungs here. Um, so uh, we're going to be probably, it, it walks you through, you know, getting uh, aerial photography, not static aerial photography. I'm going to be using this live streaming aerial photography from uh, NC1 map. Hopefully you're familiar with that. If not, you will be. It's very easy to, to use. Uh, topographic maps that you can down, you know, you can get as base maps. Um, uh, parcel maps that you can live stream as well off of NC1 map. That's kind of handy. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, pr like I said, we're going to be working primarily in shape files. I, I tend not to um, work when in the in the GIS. I'm sorry, in the Forestry 215 class, I tend not to work uh, with uh, geo databases. I think they're fantastic. I, I use them all the time, but I think they're, they tend to be a little bit confusing for students, uh, especially if they're trying to share data back and forth. Um, it, it, you got to export it into a format that can be uh, pulled into another, uh, you know, typically you export it as a shapefile, 
and then you can share your data with other people. So it just makes it a little bit uh, easier to just to stay in this the old fashioned shapefile format. Um, so going to be uh, kind of doing some of that. And of course, you're familiar with where, how you work with the data. Uh, you've got a data view and that's this little tool at the very bottom left. And then the one right next to it is the, um, the layout view. And that's where you actually create your final map product. Um, so the data view is where you pull in your data layers and you're able to uh, uh, turn layers on and off, uh, edit data, um, color your data, symbol, you know, do the symbology the way you want it and all that good stuff. Um, there are a couple of different uh, things in the table, of, uh, ways that you could look at this table of context. The thing that's important to remember, a lot of folks forget this, is when you're trying to put one layer on top of, you know, trying to move one layer uh, from here up to here, you got to be in this little uh, 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 view of the table of contents. And uh, that allows you to grab layers and move them around a little bit. So anyway, uh, what's cool about, uh, you know, ArcGIS, uh, uh, I mean, Arc Catalog, is they typically show you what the format of the layer are okay so this is showing its points lines and areas um, <clears throat> and of course as you are well aware that a shapefile is not just one file but a shapefile is a series of files that all work together and ArcGIS needs at least the .shp the .shx the .dbf and the .prj those are the four most important files um, that uh, can be used and then as you start building some more advanced features you, you create these SVNs and the uh, AVL files and those sorts of things. Um, but uh, if, if, if you are uh, sharing data it's always good to just select that whole group right there and then send it on out. Okay. Um, so and uh, again, you know, the power behind a, a GIS is the ability to store database information about each one of the, uh, the features in your data set. So this happens to be a, 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 a file, a spatial file or a map file of all the U.S. states. Each state is given one line in the database. Okay, so uh, this state right here is obviously um, Virginia. And uh, so if you had clicked on it, if I selected it, this line would uh, become selected, okay? All the information about uh, Virginia that they want you to have in this database table is all on that line. So states such as the federal identification something number, I can't remember what it's called, but the FIPS number is the identification number for that state. Um, what's the region that it's in, what's the abbreviation, and then you just keep scrolling over and there's just all these, all these things out there that are uh, um, associated with that particular file or with that particular state. Um, geodatabases, on the other hand, um, uh, you don't have to go through, <coughs> it, it doesn't piecemeal files like shapefiles do where you, know, you can end up with a gazillion shapefiles in one uh, folder um, and it's sometimes it's a little unwieldy to use. It's kind of hard to keep track of where things are. The Geo databases was a way that they could try to organize that information. So everything is stored in its own little database. I can't go and see each individual thing on the uh, if I open it up in uh, you know, like Windows File Manager. Um, I, it just won't show me all that stuff. All I'll see is this MDB file, this uh, database file, and. Uh, so, but within it, I've got these different uh, uh, feature data sets. And you can see that little plus sign means that, that there's more stuff inside there. So if I clicked on that, I would see this whole array of infrastructure layers uh, pop up. Um, same for transportation, it would be different road types, maybe even railroad and stuff like that in there. Um, within the feature data sets, you have these different classes of features, okay? And I could mix and match. That's the kind of the beauty of this. I don't have to have all this polygons in the wildlife uh, data set. I could actually have 
point layers in there and I can have uh, line layers. Uh, this is just showing polygons right there. But um, so that's one of the beauties of a, uh, of a uh, geo database is I, I can really just start organizing my stuff contextually. All right, so um, I, I have this featured data set. I want all my wildlife polygon data to be stored in there. And so it allows me to do that. Okay, so it's really handy. They're very simple to create, uh, very simple to modify. And, and uh, so I um, definitely think that's a, a very good way to go if you start exploring them. And I'm sure you have. That's I'm in the 111 class. I, I can. I can almost guarantee that that would be something <laughs> that they would teach you in there. So I'm uh, preaching to the choir here. <laughs> so anyway, that's um, pretty much it for now. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, let you uh, get started when you get a chance. Now, again, uh, and I told you in that email, if you don't uh, get ArcGIS for a few more days, don't sweat it. Um, I think you're going to fly through that, uh, that uh, homework assignment. And it's, it's just uh, follow along with James here, and uh, you'll probably be moving along at a, a faster pace than I'm talking even. But uh, there is one thing that's in there that is, is kind of interesting, and that's just a way of setting up, uh, one of many, many different ways of setting up uh, inventory points into um, the GIS. And uh, I kind of start at the point where it's already been loaded onto your uh, computer, uh, and load it up onto GIS. It's an extension called, um, um, uh oh, what's it called? <laughs> uh, oh, geez, I can't even remember what it's called now. But anyway, I'll, I'll pull it up. Uh, it's in the uh, program files and adjacent. There we go. It's called Repeating Shapes. So um, you can get online and download it. Uh, onto your computer once you get ArcGIS on there uh, and then when you open up uh, uh, it'll it'll uh, <clears throat> it'll set it up onto your computer and they'll actually put it into this program file in Genesis and when you do that then you can start taking a look at um, uh, I think yeah this text document that will walk you through uh, oh that wasn't it uh, somewhere in here is a PD, uh, well, this PDF file will walk you through too. There's actually two, a text file that kind of uh, makes it a lot bit, yeah, a lot easier to do. But the repeating shape files PDF file in there walks you through the, the install. Okay, so give it a try. If you're having trouble with it, you know, by all means, give me a call and we'll get it set up. And I think you'll like it. I think once you get it in, um, it's just a really fast way of setting up a, uh, inventory plots and uh, you can make them as spread apart or as condensed uh, as you want and uh, it's just it's go when it's going through this registration process it's a little weird so uh, that's that's the area where you might get hung up on it but go ahead and see if you can dig your way through uh, th this will be your first test to see how good you can do that and, uh, <laughs> so anyway I wish you well and I'll, I'll talk to you soon okay y'all take care